I appreciate everyone's attendance of the Wednesday night Bible class. <clears throat> Certainly appreciate uh, Steve Johnson's comments about gambling. I've uh, heard from uh, proponents of gambling in the past saying, well, you know, life is a gamble. What about life insurance? I mean, you're betting on uh, your life. And, uh, but the problem there is that uh, uh, whether it's any sort of insurance, house insurance, car insurance, the risk is already there and you're buying insurance to mitigate against that risk. In gambling, you're assuming a risk that's not there and with the hopes of uh, making a quick gain, just not authorized to do that. So appreciate that lesson, Steve. <clears throat> But we're currently engaged in the study of uh, uh, logic, formal study of, uh, or study of formal logic. Before we begin, though, let's have a short word of prayer for you. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for uh, the time that we can gather together in this form, to engage in the study of Thy Word, and we're grateful for the things that we learn and better prepare us for use in the Master's service. We pray that I continue to bless us as we uh, dwell upon that will and come more like Christ. And we thank you for him and for all the blessings that you have given us. And may we use these blessings to glorify thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> um, Gary, you'll have to turn on the screen sharing. Okay, how's that? There we go. Last time we uh, we talked about the syllogism, and I just want to go back over it uh, quickly. You know, syllogism is a, uh, a means to organize categorical statements into into an argument, and it's useful for for uh, analyzing an argument as well. <clears throat> so the first, uh, in a standard form, it, uh, the uh, form is not always standard, but in a standard uh, syllogism, there are all, always three terms. There's the major premise, the minor premise, and then the conclusion. <clears throat> in a, you know, an example, all red plants are living things. All roses are red plants. And therefore, all roses are living things. <clears throat> In abbreviated form, now we use abbreviations. It's not to make things more complicated, but it's to make it quicker to, to write. And, and once you realize what the terms are, you you recognize what, the, what they are quicker also, like, all M or P, M stands for middle term, and P is the predicate. Uh, then all S, the subject, or M, middle term. And the three little dots there, uh, just a mathematical shortcut for saying therefore. And therefore, all S, all subjects, are predicates. So they like to say they can't contain these, these three terms. <clears throat> and the minor term is the subject of the conclusion. That's why you have all S subject. The minor term above was roses. And we can we can analyze what these things are. Minor terms is in the uh, minor premise, and it's also the uh, in the conclusion. So we have roses here, roses here. That makes it the minor term. Major term is the predicate of the conclusion. The living things is the predicate, and it's up here also. And the middle term, it's in both premises, but it is not in the conclusion. You got red plants. This is how you can determine this the middle term. Red plants here in the uh, major premise, red plants in the minor premise, but it's not in the conclusion. So that makes it a middle term. 
So the major premise is the uh, premise contains a major term. Usually it's the first term that you see. And the minor premise is the one that contains the minor term. And it's usually in the middle. But it's, there is no middle premise, though. There's just major and minor and then the conclusion. So you see, uh, this, let's look at another one. All ring planets are gas giants. So no inner planets or ring planets, since no inner planets or gas giants. This is not in the, the uh, traditional order. So we have to figure out uh, what is what. We, know, we want to find the conclusion first. And since we say, uh, since, well, no inner planets or ring planets, so, or because, and that's our conclusion. So no inner planets or ring planets, that's our conclusion. And it, and it starts with the word sir. The minor, major term is the predicate of the conclusion. This is the conclusion. This is the predicate. So that is the major term. And you find that right here. That makes this the major uh, premise. Now, the major premise uh, it contains major term. Ring planets we just determined was the major premise, a uh, major term. So in the uh, uh, above example, all ring planets are gas giants. That's their major term. Well, we've identified this one as the conclusion, this one as the major premise. Well, this has to be the uh, minor premise. So no inner planets are gas giants. That's the minor premise. So we can rewrite this uh, syllogism in the uh, standard order, major, minor, and, and conclusion. We determine that all ring planets are gas giant, giants. That's their major premise. And no inner planets are gas giants. That's their minor premise. And of course, gas giants are the uh, uh, middle term. The middle term is not in the conclusion. So all ring planets uh, or no inner planets are ring planets. So uh, that's uh, hopefully a, a good review. We'll get out of that and then we'll go to uh, the mood of syllogism. Because the syllogism is composed of categorical statements, uh, the syllogism can be abbreviated following the rules concerning the substitution of letters for terms. You can use letter to uh, for the entire term. We say uh, like all S is P uh, or maybe all uh, roses are red or something like that or red plants. We don't have to do all that. We just say all S or P. So we can, uh, S will be the, uh, represent the minor term, P represent the uh, major term, S stands for subject and P for predicate. The subject is the minor term, the predicate is the major term. M will represent the middle term. And let's look at this one. Uh, <clears throat> some black cars are fast cars. All Model T cars are black cars. Therefore, some Model T cars are fast cars. Of course, now we know that the uh, this sin symbolism is invalid <clears throat> because Model T cars are not very fast. And uh, you know the conclusion has to follow from the premises, and it does not follow. The conclusion here does not follow from the premises, but we can nevertheless abbreviate it. Uh, and when abbreviated, it looks like this, some M or P, and then all S or P, and therefore some S or P. When a syllogism is arranged in standard order using the standard abbreviations for the terms, uh, this arrangement is called a schema. So if two arguments follow the same logical form, 
they have the same schema. For example, an argument which uh, substituted dogs for Model T cars and brown animals for black cars and slow animals for fast cars, we would uh, have the same schema as the Model T example above. And we just, just try and see. In other words, the uh, abbreviations for the arguments would be identical, so they have the same schema. So we now come to the mood of the syllogism. The mood refers to the various possible combinations of A, all, R, E, you know, our standard syllogism, A, E, I, O, E, none are, I, some are, and O, some are not, these kind of statements. That's what makes up the syllogism. It tells what kind of statements the syllogism contains. Uh, when arranged in standard order. The mood of our syllogism is AIA because the major premise is an I statement, some MRP. The minor premise is an A statement, <clears throat> all S or M. And the conclusion is an I statement, some S or P. Now, <clears throat> Let's look at the uh, figure of a syllogism. We got the mood, and then we have the figure of syllogisms. It's a number, and then find the placement of the middle term in the argument. Remember, the middle term is not in the conclusion. There are four possible ways the middle term can be arranged in the two premises. Uh, figure one, look down here at figure one. Let me make this a little larger. <clears throat> look down here at figure one. In figure one syllogism, the middle term is the subject of the major premise. Remember that the P is the uh, in the major premise. Uh, typically, it's in the major or, or minor premise, excuse me. The middle term is the subject of the major premise, and the predicate is the uh, the predicate. It's the predicate of the minor premise. So you have the middle term uh, of here Hindus, and it's, it's the subject of the major premise. And you have Hindus here, which is the middle term. It's the predicate of the minor premise, but it is not in the conclusion. So we know that's the, the uh, uh, middle term. So here, figure one, you have the middle term is the predicate of the major premise, Hindus are Christians. In figure one, the middle term is the subject of the um, minor premise, Hindus, some Indians are Hindus. And therefore, some Indians are not Christians. It, it doesn't matter if this is true in a statement or not. It's just showing how this thing is arranged. But figure two, you've got uh, uh, P is middle term and S is middle term. So you have P and S for the middle terms. So we know that middle term is Hindus. It, Encourage both premises, but not in the conclusion. So we, and that's just a standard definition of the middle term. <clears throat> in the major premise, Hindus is the subject, and hin no Hindus are are something, and usually the uh, uh, object of the action is the predicate. In the minor premise, it is uh, the predicate. So some Indians is the uh, subject and Hindus is the predicate. Looking again at figure one, this is the pattern for the figure one uh, symbolism, syllogism. Major premise, 
uh, Hindus as the subject here. Uh, in the major premise, Hindus is the subject. Minor premise is the predicate. And uh, if we schematize this, it's uh, that he set out its schema. It says this, no S is P, no S is P. Hindus is the middle term. And uh, P is the predicate. I should say no M is P, middle term, no M is the predicate. And then the minor premise, some S, is M. Uh, Indians is the uh, subject or the major term, if you will. Some Hindus are, uh, or some Indians are Hindu, Hindus. Hindu is the middle term. Therefore, some S is not P because there's no M. That's P. And some S is P. Well, it can't be any S's in P because there are no M's in P, even though there may be some uh, S's in M. So the mood of this syllogism is E, which is no S or something. I, which is some S is P. Then O, uh, some S is not P. So that follows the EIO uh, uh, arrangement. So uh, the major premise is a E, none R. That's this one, none R P. The minor premise is an I, some R. Some S is an M statement. And the conclusion is an O, some are not statement. And as we also pointed out previously, it's also a figure one syllogism. And this is where the uh, middle term is the predicate and the, and, the, and the major premise, the middle term is the predicate. The minor premise, uh, the middle term, is the subject of the, of the, uh, is the object, if you will, of the subject. The subject is M. And you see in the different ways it can be arranged. So we call this a uh, EIO-1 uh, syllogism. That's the figure. So when you list the mood and figure together, uh, we're describing the form of the syllogism. Uh, the form is the mood plus the figure. So you can analyze uh, both of them. So below we have examples of schemas having uh, figures two, three, and four all with the same mood, E-I-O. So no P is M, no M is P, and no P is M. These two are like. So we have some S is M, some M is S, and some M is S. And then therefore, the conclusion is some S is not P under figure two, Therefore, under figure three, some S is not P. Then under figure four, some S is not P. So you have uh, four possible types of categorical statements for each premise and the conclusions and four possible figures. So there are four times, four times, four times, four possible combinations of mood in figures, and if you ever studied uh, statistics or uh, permutations, you know that either, either there are 256 forms of syllogism. And uh, I would uh, be the first myth that you have to study uh, the, 
the mood and figures for a little while to really get it down in your mind exactly how it works. Otherwise, it's going to be somewhat confusing. It's not something that you typically run across. So here are all the 256 forms of syllogisms. If you want to study all those, you can be my guest. But there they are. We're not going to spend any time on it just to show you what Ford and Ford and Ford and Ford is. And we'll get rid of that. Let's look at the uh, truth and validity of syllogisms. So when a syllogism is examined, uh, we want to look for the validity of the syllogism. Now, a syllogism is valid if the conclusion is demanded by the premises. It logically follows uh, from the premises. And the conclusion is demanded by the premises. If the premises are true and the syllogism is valid, then the conclusion must be true. If a syllogism has true premises and a false conclusion, then the syllogism is invalid. That is, the conclusion is not demanded by the premises. In a valid syllogism, one or more of the premises may be false. Uh, the conclusion is going to be false as well, even though it's demanded by the premises. But if the premises are true and the conclusion is demanded by the premises, then the conclusion is true. It just follows. The validity of the syllogism depends on the form of the, of the argument only. It is not dependent on the truth of the premises or the truth of the uh, the conclusion. You can have a wrong conclusion with the uh, true premises. So here's an example of a valid syllogism and one of the premises happens to be false, but the syllogism remains valid. All dogs are brown animals. All poodles are dogs. Therefore, all poodles are brown animals. Well, if it were true that all dogs are brown, then all poodles would necessarily be brown. But the major premise, all dogs are brown animals, is false. Nevertheless, the uh, the structure of the, the uh, argument is valid. The conclusion is demanded by the premises to test for validity. If we assume that the premises are true, then we see if the conclusion would have to be true. And if all dogs are brown animals, if you never saw anything but a brown dog, and we know poodles are dogs, then it has to be that all poodles are brown. Well, here's an example of an invalid syllogism with all true premises and a true conclusion. All dogs are mammals. That's true. All dogs are canines. That's true. Therefore, all canines are mammals. Well, uh, we know that all uh, that the canines are mammals. But when you say all canines are mammals, there could be some uh, animals out there with lots of teeth that are not mammals. So each premise is true as well as the conclusion. Uh, however, the conclusion does not follow, and it's not demanded or implied by the premises, because you can have uh, other animals that are canines, even though it's, it's true, this is true. Uh, but it doesn't follow from the premises, just because dogs are mammals and dogs are canines doesn't necessarily, it doesn't follow from that, that all canines are mammals. And we could change this up. 
uh, <clears throat> if we reword these, we could say all canines are mammals and all dogs are canines, <clears throat> therefore all dogs are mammals. So canine, the middle term, is not in the conclusion. You look uh, here, dogs are not in the uh, uh, conclusion, but we're talking about dogs here. And so, it, dogs cannot be the middle, the properly middle term. But if it's middle term, it's got to be. In, it can't be in here. So, and we're we're talking about dogs. So this is not worded correctly, even though it's a a true syllogism. So once a syllogism has been examined for validity and sound found to be valid, it uh, then may be examined to determine the truth or falsehood of the premises. We have to first determine if it's a valid uh, syllogism. If the syllogism is invalid, there's no reason to go any further. But it's, if it's found to be valid, then you still have to determine uh, the truth of the premises and whether the uh, conclusion is also true. If, if it logically follows from the premises and is true. So the conclusion of a sound syllogism must always be true. Not necessarily a valid syllogism, but a sound one. <clears throat> so truth, uh, I mean, the validity and soundness are two different things, or truth, two different things. So we don't want to confuse truth with uh, validity. So in logic, uh, the two terms, truth and validity, are not synonymous. We tend to use them that way, uh, but in logic, they're not they're not the same. Here's another example of a valid and true or sound syllogism. All dogs are mammals. All poodles are dogs. So we know dogs is the middle term because it's not in the conclusion. Therefore, all poodles are mammals. Uh, we know that in the conclusion, we're going to have to eliminate dogs. So we only have poodles and mammals to work with. So that's why the conclusion is demanded from the premises. We have to eliminate the middle term and we have to work with what's left. So the conclusion is demanded from the premises. So the syllogism is valid and the premises are true. Uh, therefore, the conclusion is true. This is a sound uh, syllogism. The different types of syllogism with respect to validity and soundness, that is truth, can be arra arranged as follows. You got the argument, and you can have an invalid uh, syllogism, or you can have a valid syllogism. Once we determine the valid syllogism, then we have to determine if it's a sound argument or an unsound argument. And if it's uh, unsound, one of the premises are uh, false, or the conclusion does not necessarily uh, follow. Of course, if it doesn't necessarily follow, it's invalid. If it's sound, the uh, conclusion follows from the premises. The premises are true, therefore, the conclusion is true. So there's two ways uh, for a syllogism to be bad. It can be invalid, or it can be unsound. So how do we uh, test for these things? <clears throat> Most of the time, you you'll be able to figure it out without uh, not much uh, stress because it's really sometimes and most of the time is fairly obvious, but not not always. So the validity of a syllogism is uh, determined solely by its form. 
okay, is not determined by the meanings of the individual statements. <clears throat> Certain forms are always valid while other forms are invalid. So there are many ways to test the validity of a syllogism. Uh, the two that are, can be considered here are testing by counterexamples and by rules. Uh, first, we'll consider testing by counterexamples, and we do this through the substitution of terms. So we can say, uh, for example, some Christians are not critical thinkers. That's an I statement. Some humanists are not critical thinkers. That's an I statement. Therefore, some humanists are, I should say, these are O statements. Uh, and this is the I statement. Therefore, some humanists are uh, Christians. <clears throat> But the syllogism is invalid. So a syllogism with true premises and a false conclusion is necessarily invalid. So if we substitute terms in the syllogism such that the premises are obviously true and the conclusion is ob obviously false, we would show the same syllogism to be in invalid. Remember, this is a in the A. EIO uh, 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 square of opposition. You got all are, none are, some are, and some are not. So the uh, O uh, corner of the square of opposition is, an, is this some women are not. So that's an O statement. The syllogism would then read like this. Some women are not lawyers. This is also an O statement. Some men are not lawyers. Therefore, you got to eliminate the uh, middle term. Middle term, that's the term that's missing is lawyers. So that's middle term. It's not here. So we know that we have to use men and women in this uh, in the conclusion. Therefore, some men are women. Well, that's a valid uh, uh, form. It has a valid form, but it's uh, uh, it's not true. <clears throat> this uh, has the form of a O O I dash two. Immediate blood, the lawyers is the middle term, women is predicate, and men is subject. The O form is some S is not P, and the I form is some S is P. See, some S is not P, some S is not uh, P. In this case, M is the middle term, since we're going to eliminate it. <clears throat> So the figure two form is P is M in the major premise. P is M. And then, uh, let's see, where was that? Men is the subject. The O form is, uh, like I say, some is not uh, P. The I form is some is P. <clears throat> so some S is P. So that's an I form. And you look at the uh, uh, distribution of these forms, it's a, it's a figure two form. So the syllogism uh, immediately above has a obviously ab absurd conclusion although both uh, premises are true. So if both premises are true, and they are, and the conclusion is false, which it is, then the problem has to be with the uh, form of the syllogism. It is uh, invalid. So here's another example and a counterexample. Uh, no man is immortal. Uh, that's 
a uh, E form. Some angels are not men. That's an O form. Therefore, some angels are immortal. That's an I form. So we test this with the counterexample. We can construct a syllogism with the same form, EOI-1. But with true premises and a false conclusion, it could look like this. No dogs or horses. Some cats are not dogs. Therefore, some cats are horses. We're using the same EOI form and with the uh, figure one. So when you look at it this way, you can see an obvious, obviously uh, uh, problem. No dogs or horses, that's true. Some cats are not dogs. You may think, well, does that mean some cats are dogs? No, you're not. When you say in, in logic, when you say some or something, you're not talking about the rest of it. Uh, they could be something entirely different. But you're saying if you take a portion of the whole universe of cats, they're not dogs. Of course, we know all cats are not dogs, but so this is a, a true uh, a premise. Therefore, using the, the form, EOI form, some cats are horses. So in the substitution, we know this, this is just a, a ridiculous statement. Uh, no cats are horses. But if you said no cats or horses, it doesn't follow this EOI form. So using the EOI form, we know that this is wrong. So it's easier to see the problem with the second syllogism than with the first one. Uh, nevertheless, when you do a substitution using the same form, uh, they'll stand or fall together. If the second in is invalid, then so is the first necessarily. So if you know, we know that this, we can just look at that and tell that that's uh, not true. And they both have exactly the same form. So we know that this has to be uh, untrue all as well. If you're testing an argument for a validity, but are unable to develop a counterexample, there are two possible reasons. Either the argument is valid, uh, so no counter example is possible. Or, you know, you just maybe not being creative enough. If you suspect that an argument is invalid, but have not been able to construct a counter example, uh, try starting with a, a conclusion you know is false, and then invent major or minor terms to go along with it, uh, that when uh, substituted, that make the uh, conclusion false using the same form. You have to be sure and use the same form. To finish the counterexample, you simply need to find a middle term that makes both the premises true. So uh, let's use an example. Suppose you wanted to write a counterexample for this example. All Paul's writings are first century compositions. Some epistles are not uh, Paul's writing. All Paul's writings are, that's an A form. Some are not, that's a uh, O form. Therefore, some epistles are not uh, first century compositions. That's an I form. So we have to use that uh, A uh, I and O, A, I, O. You have to use that deal. Use the right account example. Start by making the conclusion false. If students is substituted for epistles and pe people for first century compositions, we get the following. All students are people. So some students are not epistles. We can say oh, some, uh, all epistles are people, some students are not epistles, therefore some students are not people. But well, we know this is false. The conclusion is false. Since all students are people, 
we uh, wrote people in here. Some students, not people. Unless you want to say a dog is a student or, uh, you know, your, your horse is uh, learning some tricks that makes it a student. But in conventional use, when you say students, not people, you're talking about people. People are people, or not, not people. It just didn't make sense. And you can say, uh, uh, all people, all students are people. That would be true. Some students are not people, be untrue. Some student, uh, students are not people. That's also untrue. So you need to simply find a middle term that makes the premises true. So use your imagination here to find a middle term. <clears throat> uh, you can say, uh, all geniuses are people. Some students are not geniuses. So some students are not people. And if you uh, genius was a middle term, it doesn't appear in the conclusions. So that, that would make it a middle term. You, you can do things like that. So that's, uh, that's how you test uh, syllogisms by Substitution, you may want to look at this uh, again. Let's look at distributed terms. Well, we'll start next time on this, distributed terms, and then we'll get to testing syllogism by rules. And these are uh, somewhat complicated uh, areas to grasp. And you have to go over these things a number of times uh, to really get them down. And I'm not saying that they're ever going to become second nature, but at least you'll have a familiarity with them. And if you ever get into a formal argument, you can test the validity and the soundness of them by using these principles. Thank you for your attention.